Hey everybody, this is God Sad for the Sad Truth. Today I wanted to share with you um, some material that I cover in uh, my courses whenever I'm discussing psychology of decision making. Specifically, I'd like to go over some techniques for eliciting attribute importance weights just to give you a sense of what that means. Whenever you're making multi-attribute choices, meaning choices uh, that are defined by many attributes, for example, a car is defined by many attributes, its gas efficiency, its price, the power of its engine, or if you're choosing between mates, right? each mate is defined by his or her personality, how good looking they are, uh, how much money they make a year, uh, whether they're funny or not, you know, all sorts of attributes that define them. And so when a person is making a decision, how do they weigh each of those attributes in arriving at a final choice? That's, of course, a very important uh, issue that uh, certainly consumer psychologists and marketing and marketers in general wish to uh, you know, uncover. And so what I'd like to do is cover four such techniques today, uh, just to tell you quickly what they are, list them, and then you'll hopefully follow as I go along. They're, they're called the non-constant sum technique, the constant sum technique, the Q sort technique and conjoint analysis. Uh, so, but before I do that, let me just briefly mention, uh, you know, in what context this arises. So, if take for example the weighted additive rule. This is a decision rule that basically says that we look at all of the attributes, multiply them by the importance weights of each of the attributes for each of the alternatives, and then we choose the one that scores the highest. So, for example, here you've got four alternatives, alternatives one, two, three, four, each of which is defined by four attributes, D1, D2, D3, D4. Uh, these scores are basically on a scale of one to seven, one is the worst, seven is the best. This is how each of the alternatives scores on the attributes. So alternative one scores a six, five, two, and a six on each of the four respective attributes. Of course, what is of relevance uh, for us today is how do we calculate these weights? How do we get these? In this case, this consumer views D1 as his or her most important attribute, followed by D2, then D3, and then finally D4. And so we'd like to cover the various techniques that allow us to elicit from consumers these weights. <clears throat> Excuse me. But just to complete this example, if you were to multiply the sum of the weights by the alternative scores, so it would be 6 times 0 0.5 plus 5 times 0 0.25 plus 2 times 0 0.2 plus 6 times 0 0.05. If I haven't done my arithmetic uh, incorrectly, that should add up to 4.95. You would do the same thing for each of the other alternatives. The one that scores the highest is the one that you choose. In this case, it's alternative 3. But again, today's focus is on techniques to elicit these weights. So let's start with the first technique. So this is known as the non-constant sum technique. So if let's say I've got eight attributes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Uh, the way that I would go about eliciting from a consumer his or her importance weights is I would simply ask the consumer to provide me a score from 0 to 100. 0 is the least important possible up to a maximal score of 100 to give me uh, their independent uh, score for each of the eight attributes. So uh, attribute A might get a score of 50. Attribute B is really, really important to the particular consumer, gives it a score of 90. Attributes C and D are equally unimportant with a score of 5, and you go on and so on. So here you're not forcing the consumer to assign importance weights in such a way that they add up to a final total. Rather, you're simply asking them to independently provide you a score for each of the different alternatives. Hence, this is why it's called non-constant sum. You're not forcing it. You're not forcing the process to add up to a certain total. At times when you have fewer number of attributes, let's say a particular product category has only four very important attributes that define choice in that product category. So it's attributes A, B, C, D. Then in this case, it makes cognitive sense to say, well, look, I'm going to give you 100 points and please assign importance weights to the four alternatives, uh, the four attributes in such a way that their total score adds up to 100. So here in this case, 
uh, this one gets assigned a 20, this one 50, this one 25, this one 5. If you add these up, they add up to 100. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this case, what you're effectively saying is that attribute B, by virtue of you having given it a score of 50, is it is equally important as the three other attributes combined. And so what this technique forces you to do is it forces relative comparisons across the attributes because you always have to be making sure that this, the, the totality of weights add up to 100. So again, this is a very good technique to use when you have a fewer number of attributes. The third technique, known as the QSOR technique, is one that works when you have a lot of attributes. And then what you'd like to do is break up the process for the consumer across many different stages so that hopefully you can get, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you could get accurate data. So let's suppose we start in this case with 12 attributes, A all the way to L. Again, remember that an attribute is gas efficiency is an attribute of a car, right? A personality of a person is, is uh, an attribute when you're making a mate choice, okay? And so I've got these 12 attributes here, and, and my goal is to elicit from the consumers uh, how they assign weights to each of those 12 attributes. So this QSOR technique has multiple steps, so let's go through each step. So in the first step, I will ask the consumer to simply classify each of the attributes into one of five importance categories. So imagine there are five buckets, you know, unimportant bucket, slightly important attributes, moderately important attributes, important attributes, and very important attributes. And so in this case, I mean, I just did these, obviously, it's a hypothetical example, there's no meaning to these. So in this case, A and G, are uh, the consumer has decided are very unimportant to him, and then F, J, K are slightly important going on all the way to uh, attributes H, I, and L are maximally important. They're very important. So now that we've uh, categorized the attributes into each of these five buckets of importance, the next natural step, of course, here's step two, is to rank order the attributes within each of the buckets. So I know that A and G are within your unimportant category, but maybe one is more important than the other. So in this case, the consumer might say, well, A is the most important here and G is the second most important within this bucket of importance. Then we go to the next category. So let's say I put them here, one, two, three. This means that within this bucket, J is most important, followed by K, followed by F. I do the same thing with this category, D followed by B. In this category, it's C, then E. And then finally, in this cat, in the most important category, it's L, I, and H. So now I have uh, all the data that is necessary for me to put them in a rank ordered list. So the most important would be L, I, H. Here they are, L, I, H. I put a, a line here to sort of show you visually that these constitute the most important category. This is the second most important category. This is the third most important. This is the third, fourth most important, followed by the fifth most important. So now I have a rank ordered list of how this particular consumer views uh, the importance of these attributes. In, in some cases, what you do is you allow the consumer to then go through this list and make any swaps or any adjustments. So for example, the consumer might say, well, you know, Upon looking here, actually, I think that the, the least important here, B, and the most important of the lesser cat of the lower category, J, I'd like to swap these. I'd like to put J as number seven and B as number eight. That's why I've got these in, in red. So, for example, if you're doing this online, you could force the algorithm to only allow swaps that are adjacent. In other words, that are next to each other. For example, it wouldn't make sense if the person said, oh, you know what, in retrospect, I'd like to swap uh, number one and number 12, right? Because that would suggest that either the person is completely wacko or he's fooling around or he's not taking it seriously. So you could impose the, if you'd like, the, the size of the swap. Uh, so once the consumer feels that, okay, this is now my final list, this is my, my correct and accurate ordered list, 
then what remains to be done is now that you've got this final list right here, you work your way up using the non-constant sum technique. So if on a, on a score, you know, using a score of 0 to 100, please assign an importance weight that captures each of these. So this is my least important, I'll give it a 5. Then my next important, I'll give it a 10. The next one, I'll give it a 20, whatever the numbers are. Obviously, if you were to give, as you're going up, if you were to give a score that is lower than the, the one that's before it, then of course it would flag you that that's not possible because obviously this is already a ranked ordered list. And so you'd work your way up until you get to the end. So what you're doing with the QSort technique is breaking up the cognitive process into distinct stages so that hopefully these final weights that you get from the consumer are as accurate as can be. Now, each of these three techniques, you are asking the consumer directly what his or her importance weights are. There's a fourth technique known as conjoint analysis, which is actually, I mean, truly brilliant and incredibly powerful in tackling this exact problem when you're trying to understand what people's importance weights are, but you don't want to ask them frontally. You don't want to ask them, you know, in a straight manner, either because, frankly, they may not know exactly what their importance weights are, or what if they don't want to tell you what their importance weights are. Let's suppose somebody uh, chooses the car based on a show-off factor, right? So one of the attributes is, you know, show-off capability of the car. Well, I may not feel uh, comfortable sharing that information with you because maybe it'll make me look as though I'm shallow, right? So if I'm trying to adhere to social desirability, there is such a thing as social desirability bias when we do this type of research. And so for for several possible reasons, you may not want to directly uh, ask from a consumer what his or her importance weights. Well, conjoint analysis allows you to infer a person's importance weights by engaging in a form of, if you like, reverse engineering. So let's see how that works. Really quite an amazing technique. This is just one of several ways of doing conjoint analysis. I've chosen a simple example just to sort of for expository clarity. So suppose that we have a product category that is defined by three important attributes. So attribute one, two, and three, each of which is binary. In other words, we're not going to have a continuous variable here. Each one can get a score of either high or low, right? So it's a binary variable. So how many possible alternatives could you, could you create when you have three attributes each of which is defined by two possible values, well, it's eight possibilities. Two times two times two, or two to the three, to the third. So let, let me just list them here. You have H is for high, L is for low. So you have, for example, if these were cars, you could have a car that scores high, high, high on all three attributes, or high, high, low, high, low, low, and so on. There are eight of these, right? Each of these combinations is known as a profile. So in this case, there are eight car profiles. So what I would do with the consumer is I would list this, these full profiles, all of these profiles, and then I would ask him to please provide me your ranking of these eight cars. So for example, the consumer might say, well, of these profiles, this is my favorite one this is my second favorite one, this is my third favorite one, and so on and so forth. In other words, you are asking him to provide you with a holistic score his or holistic rank ordering of his preferences. And now here's the magic of conjoint analysis. Now I've got all of the data that I need to reverse engineer and calculate what your importance weights must have been for you to generate these rank ordered preferences. Why? I now have each of your rank order preferences here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is the dependent variable. And I've got, these are the three independent variables. In this case, they are binary variables, either coded as one or zero. For example, H could be one, L could be zero. And so here I've got an equation, Y. Y in this case is the, you know, the rank ordering scores d1, d2, d3 are simply these dummy variables, ones and zeros. And I'm going to try to estimate the betas that correspond to this data set. Well, these betas 
are going to be what allows me to infer the importance weights of each attribute. So notice here how I reversed engineered what your utility, if you'd like, your importance weight of each attribute must have been for you to generate these preferences. That's really the magic of conjoint analysis. You're able to obtain a person's importance weights without having directly asked them what his or her weights uh, were. So there you have it, four techniques that I've discussed here, non-constant sum, constant sum, uh, Q-sort technique, and conjoint analysis. Uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed this lecture. Hope you're having a good day. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.